The integration of the Germans into the now Christian Roman world served historians only briefly as a purpose for their work. Even the old Cassiodorus had perceived it differently. What does a historian do? Christian studies also possesses narrators of history who, calm in their ecclesiastical gravity, recount the shifting movements of events and the unstable history of kingdoms with eloquent but very cautious splendor. Gregory of Tours added the more specific wish to keep alive the memory of those dead and gone in order to give encouragement to believers. Bede had spelled out most precisely the purpose as one of instructing and edifying, for if history records good things of good men, the thoughtful hearer is encouraged to imitate what is good. If it records evil things of wicked men, the good religious listener or reader is encouraged to avoid all that is sinful and perverse, and to follow what he knows to be good and pleasing to God. Such purposes were perceived not as endangering, but as enhancing historical truth, while its criterion remained the ancient one of accuracy. The touchstone now was not sensory experience, but reference to the sacred tradition. Thus written sources played an important role, and with this role came a devotion to the correct text. Cassiodorus called for faultless books. For fear lest the mistakes of scribes be fixed in unpolished minds, since that which is manifestly planted and rooted in the recesses of the memory cannot easily be torn out. One and a half centuries later, Bede's attention to sources expressed well the concern for their reliability and orthodoxy. But in order to avoid any doubts as to the accuracy of what I have written, in the minds of yourself or of any who may listen to or read this history, allow me briefly to state the authorities upon whom I chiefly depend. Indeed, so modern was Bede that scholars have praised him for his diligent use of sources, for his keen appreciation of documents and letters, which he often laboriously solicited and then included in his work, and for giving an unusually clear designation of author and work whenever he quoted from his sources. But Bede, of course, was not moved by scientific motives, but by his respect for the authority of the source and the awareness that not to match account and source or to distort a document would damage the truthfulness expected of a writer on sacred subjects. The religious purpose of the contemporary histories also governed their style and composition. Cassiodora still was imbued with the ancient rhetoric's ideals of elegance, but to Gregory of Tours, the disclaimer of stylistic excellence meant more than the ancient topos of routinely professing modesty about one's style. After him, one of the authors of the Chronicle of Fredegar professed that, Thus I am compelled, so far as my rusticity and ignorance permit, to hand on as briefly as possible whatever I have learned. The widespread lack of learning could excuse a style of lacking, po lacking polish, but men of faith went further and endorsed such a style as reflecting the Christian humility at the time and facilitating the instruction of the masses. Gregory of Tours proved that such a style need not be dull when he described the words and events in vivid passages like the following. In the year the winter was a grievous one, and more severe than usual, so that the streams were held in the chains of frost, and furnished a path for the people like dry ground. Birds, too, were affected by the cold and hunger, and were caught in the hand without any snare when the snow was deep. In their own often fumbling way, the Christian historians of the 500s and 600s had transformed historiography in the image of the Christian faith, and into a form fitting the new world of kingdoms. Occupied with this transformation, they were content to drop the ancient fascination with eloquence and to mention eschatological matters, rarely. Their historiographical views would prove compatible with the world of the three centuries after the mid-700s, but also flexible enough to accommodate a profusion of historiographical forms. The latter sufficed for discussion of continuity through Rome and chronology, for integrating new people into the Latin world, and for establishing the authority of new dynasties. The Carolingian and Anglo-Saxon Consolidation in Historiography In the period between 750 and 900, the writing of history flourished beyond all expectations in the Carolingian Empire and in Alfred the Great's Kingdom of Wessex. It did so in the context of a general revival of classical learning and stimulated exciting events to outstanding men and the needs of two strong states. Yet, while one of the states was a kingdom, the other one cast some histories once more under the spell of empire. The revival of empire. 
during the 8th century, the Frankish state had recovered its vigor under its new Carolingian dynasty. The coronation in 800 of Charlemagne as emperor epitomized the Carolingian accomplishments, although neither contemporaries nor latter scholars have agreed on the exact meaning of the coronation beyond its being a testimony to a remarkable fusion of the Roman imperial idea, Christian faith, and Frankish kinship. A tripartite fusion. Contemporary historians did not escape the spell of developments that, for the first time since the fall of the Roman Empire in the West, created a quasi-universal political entity. The reality of this entity, however, never matched the universal claim implied by the title Imperator. Nevertheless, the idea of a Christian Roman Empire found once more a partial actualization, and its spell would last throughout the medieval period. Some elements of medieval life gave substance. Through the concept of such a Christian commonwealth, the shared faith in its institution, the church, the common stock of learning, and the longing for the Roman peace. But the influence of those elements was countered by powerful regional, tribal, and strictly local forces, which favored numerous and separate units of life of less than imperial hope. This tension between universalism and localism, which became a characteristic of medieval life and throughout, affected the historiography of the period. For example, we only see this period as a time of feudalism. But in the Carolingian state, the biblical and spiritual interpretation of history was being tempted again by the lure of a congenial secular order. This temptation represented just one more variation on the wider dilemma of how to reconcile the universal sacred order with a specific mundane context. Contemporary historians succeeded in bridging the gap, but as always only temporarily and incompletely. But it would have been difficult to discover in the histories of the Carolingian heyday the problem of the fusion. To the contrary, historiography received a substantial infusion of vigor through the revival of classical learning. In the characteristic Carolingian manner, this revival blended renovation and innovation. Biography and Hagiography The veritable renaissance of biography writing during the 8th and 9th centuries should surprise no one. Society was a network of individual relationships, and contemporaries had no doubts that the deeds of nobles and pious persons shaped the world. Outstanding leaders won battles, ruled, converted whole tribes, founded monasteries, and offered to their contemporaries ideals and standards of conduct. What better mirror of the past could there be than accounts of how monarchs, abbots, bishops, and saints had spent their lives? Models for biography writing were available from the ancients, particularly through Plutarch and Suetonius and from the rich store of hagiography, the descriptions of saintly lives. The Christian church had always cherished the inspiration and emulation invoked by the saint. The Bible told of such heroes of faith and did so, and the stories about the martyrs of the early church. The faithful narrated the lives and deeds of saintly persons, including the church fathers, over and over again, and eventually wrote them down, as in the famous and pattern-setting life of St. Martin, around 400, by Sulpicius Severus. From the 6th and 7th centuries on, hagiography flourished. The stories of the saints who, as heroes of the Christian faith, gradually became patrons of days, parishes, regions, families, and professions, appeared in a variety of hagiograph hag hagiographical material, including inscriptions, liturgical texts, calendars, legends, and martyrologies. As their number increased, the stories of saints acquired some standard features. The saints Youth was either precociously pious or flawed until a conversion experience changed everything. Miracles were performed and hardships endured. And after death, the body might remain incorrupt. The similarities did not matter, since these biographies wished to present not innovative stories, but the typical manifestations of the holy in this world. They aimed at spiritual edification. To the dismay of modern historians who equipped with present-day concepts of verification, have searched for, but often have been unable to discern, the actual events. The vitae of saints persisted so well because as living documents, their text and presentation changed in accord with the views and preferences of the changing periods. Already in the early medieval period, most of the saints were no longer hermits, but persons who acted in the world on behalf of the church. Hence, the description of their deeds began to resemble much more closely historical accounts, as, for example, the lives of the great missionaries, Bede's Life of St. Cuthbert, Alcuin's Life of Willibrod, and Willibod's Life of Boniface. 
The more the church linked up with secular society, the less the lives of its heroes were given exclusively to contemplation, and the smaller the distance became between saints' lives and the biographies of secular persons. Finally, Einhard created a model for the biography of a prominent Christian layman with his Life of Chalmay. He, however, owed a greater debt to Suetonius than to the hagiographers, a fact apparent in the very structure of his work. Charlemagne's deeds were covered in the first part of his character portrait, was given in the second, but Einhard did not share Suetonius' skeptical attitude toward his subject. On the contrary, he had known the elderly Charlemagne well, admired the ruler's majestic appearance, always stately and dignified, whether he was standing or sitting. In Charlemagne's dignity, magnanimity, uh, uh, discernment, and constancy. As one could attribute such praise by to flattery by a fawning courtier, it would be better to view it as the application of the hagiographical catalog of virtues to the model of the ideal king. The latter also carried some Germanic marks when Einhard praised Charlemagne's martial deeds, calling him king rather than emperor, recorded proudly that Charlemagne used to wear the national, that is to say, the Frankish dress, and acknowledged benevolently Charlemagne's concubines. Einhard exerted a long and strong influence on subsequent biographies, specifically on Bishop Asser's Life of Alfred the Great, 893. That work's synthesis of personality, faith, and deeds emphasized the pious king Alfred over Alfred the Anglo-Saxon warrior king. Alfred was like Solomon, who, despising all the glory and riches of the world, sought first wisdom from God, and so found both. And the work told how the poor had no helpers, but very few save him alone. Of course, Asser also narrated Alfred's victories over the pagans. The warrior and the pious man also coexisted in the anonymous Life of Edward, the Confessor. Many of Edward's features described in the first part, such as his fondness for the hunt and his great skills as a warrior, fit ill with the image of Edward the Saint, who was chaste and worked miracles. Unless one remembers and accepts the contemporary Anglo-Saxon ideal of kingship with its mixture of Germanic and Christian traits, in which one person could be a warrior, ruler, and a saint. This is an important note to remember. That unity between secular deeds and sanctity remained precarious. It burst asunder in Bishop Began's biography of Charlemagne's son, Louis the Pious. Began praised the strong sanctity of Louis, or Louis, who had learned from childhood on to fear and love God, distributed for God's sake whatever property he possessed among the poor. When the Pope came to crown Louis, they talked each day about the loftiest topics of the Holy Church. But Thegan approvingly reported that the pagan narratives or songs which he had learned when young, Louis despised and would not suffer to read, or listen to, or have them taught. Thus ended an endeavor which could have incorporated the Germanic epics into the body of Frankish historical writings. Charlemagne, although he was neither a French nor German, used to listen at dinner table to music and the stories and deeds of the ancient kings written out for posterity, but his son found them too rude and lacking in an edification. In the year 883, Notker Balbulus, a monk of St. Gaul, wrote a biography of Charlemagne that piled story upon story to form a treasury of anecdotes. Little as Notker's work mattered as history, it signaled a remarkable development. As the years passed, Charlemagne's biography was turning into legend. A distant cousin of biography, the Gesta. The Carolingian period also sponsored a peculiar form of history called the Gesta. The name resulted from a rather arbitrary treatment of the Latin phrase res gestae, or things which happen. Medieval scholars, who were never clearly delimited the genres of history writing from each other, left the Gesta, or things which happened, too, without a proper definition. The gesta can best be characterized as a variation of the biographical genre. It described the lives and deeds of the holders of certain offices, abbots or bishops, for example, and in the process it delivered biographies of institutions. The admirable continuity of ecclesiastical institutions made them the preferred subjects of gesta. When secular personages were at the center of the work, the English translation of gesta as deeds describes well the increased emphasis on actions and the more precarious link to the institution. The Book of the Popes, begun sometime in the 6th or 7th century, and containing an annotated list of the popes in St. Peter, 
could be considered the Gesta's archetypal ancestor. It documented the unbroken apostolic succession at the same time as it recorded pontificates, papal actions, and gifts to the church from secular rulers. The Book of the Popes and his wish to please the Carolingian family inspired Paulus Diaconus to write a Gesta of the bishops of Metz, which demonstrated how useful the Gesta in a fearless table-like form could be for recording the past of institutions. Another testimony to the value of the Gesta as institutional history came with the Gesta Abatrum, Fontanellan, Fontanellancium, honoring the abbots of the Norman monastery of St. Wandrill. Much like other histories, the Gesta also could serve secondary purposes. It could be useful for documenting certain rights and privileges of a monastery, whether by showing its age, mentioning its founding documents, or pleading its cause. During the 11th and 12th centuries, respectively, the Gesta form remained popular for histories of bishops and their bishoprics, and of abbots and their monasteries. The genre also was eventually used simply for recording deeds and events detached from a clear institutional setting and even of a secular nature. There were works entitled Gesta that dealt with the stories of Emperor Frederick Barbarossa, Norman dukes, English kings, and the Crusades. In most of these works, the genre came close to losing its distinct identity and to fusing with other forms. Annals From List to Narrative Histories Annals began to abound in the Carolingian period. Much like the Annals Maximi of ancient Rome, the Christian Annals had a religious origin. While the Annals Maximi told the proper days for certain rituals, the early medieval Annals developed from Easter tables. And just as the Romans had added more and more notes to the Annales Maximi and the Fasti Consulares, and thus created the pattern for year by year that is analytic treatments of the past, so medieval monks added more and more information to the Easter tables. As for the influences from the fully developed late Roman analytic tradition, they were probably slight. Now in the Carolingian period, annals became a favorite way to record the past, particularly in monasteries. Monks, mostly anonymous, noted items, copied ancient texts from the Greco-Roman period of interest and importance for each year and thus created an institutionally useful ongoing history. In their fully developed form, annals could closely resemble chronicles and serve a variety of aims. When in 752, Pippin, the father of Charlemagne, wrestles the kingmans kingman, uh, kingship away from the Merovingians, his uncle Childebrand initiated a quasi-official Carolingian history titled The History or Deeds of the Franks. It was an updated version of the Chronicle of Fredegar and was soon overshadowed by another work. For the period from 741 to 829, the Frankish kingdom possessed a kind of official history in the royal Frankish annals. The number of titles under which this work is known reminds us that medieval historians named their works with great nonchalance, if at all. The author often did not even give his own name. Indeed, for most annals, there was more than one author. Thus, scholars have frequently named annals simply after the place where they were written, or where they were found. The Royal Frankish Annals once were called the Annales Laurasines Majors, after the monastery at Lorsch, where the oldest version was discovered. The compiling of the Royal Frankish Annals began in the 790s and ended abruptly in 829, when the analyst may have died or simply had given up. However, there was rhyme and reason to the first entry, a laconic sentence. 741. Charles, Major Domo of the Palace died. A point in history had been reached where the Carolingian family's importance overshadowed that of the royal Merovingians. The Carolingian Coupe of 752 was blessed by the analyst. Childeric, who was falsely called king, it was tonsured and sent into a monastery. Somehow it all seemed God's will, just as when by God's help and the intercession of the blessed apostle Peter Pippin with his Franks had the victory or when in the Saxon campaign of 772, the whole Frankish army was saved through God's grace by a sudden rainfall. And while the description of the coronation in 800 was short of explanations, it could have done well as an official view. Think of the Carolingian Chronicles, Royal Frankish Annals. On the most holy day of Christmas, when the king rose from prayer in front of the shrine of the blessed apostle Peter, to take part in the mass, Pope Leo placed the crown on his head and he was hailed by the whole Roman people. 
to the August Charles, crowned by God, the great and peaceful emperor of the Romans, life and victory. After the acclamations, the Pope addressed him in the manner of the old imperators. The name of Patricus was now abandoned, and he was called Emperor and Augustus. With so close a connection between annals and ruling family, it does not surprise that the royal Frankish annals end in 829, a time of disintegration for the Carolingian realm. Afterwards, Carolingian affairs were recorded by annals of regional scope, which quite often reflected the specific perspectives of the new emerging kingdoms, Western, Eastern, and Central, with the latter retaining the imperial title. Central Europe. Think of the Holy Roman Empire. Modern readers have often been puzzled, even annoyed, by what they have considered the haphazard mixture of the trivial and the important in annals. Even the quasi-official Royal Frankish Annals spoke not only of campaigns, assemblies, and embassies, but also of the rhythm of the seasons, of the calamities caused by their deviations from their normal course, of the deeds of nobles, of the life of the imperial court, and of signs of divine power, such as earthquakes, strange lights, and miraculous healings and rescues, which were attributed to the supernatural. Actually, such annals provide the medieval counterpart to classical cultural history. They reflected the Christian image of the cosmos, with its spiritual unity and hierarchy of all things and events. Analysts were well content simply to portray that world and would have rejected the idea that mundane phenomena could be by themselves, if only carefully selected and arranged, yield meaning, explanation, or a sense of development. God's decree governed all in the Christian world, and it was for the most part mysterious. In such a world, the records of events, besides telling of what happened, contained divine messages for human beings. An earthquake or a swarm of locusts warned people, a vision evoked hope, and the fate of an individual provided a lesson. History in the Classical Mode The historiography of the Carolingian period included one unusually stylish narrative by an unusual man, Nithard, whose birth resulted from a misalliance between a daughter of Charlemagne and a court poet, was a learned man and an accomplished soldier. His histories, the histories of Nithard, told the story of the disintegration of the Carolingian Empire and the struggle between Louis the Pious' sons, Lothair, Charles, and Louis. But rather than write annals, Nithard created a quasi-classical monograph with a central theme, the decline of a once powerful state. Nithard must have known that the division of that state was all but final. As for the feeling of despair provoked by that insight, Nithard was better off than the ancient historians, particularly Sallust. They could find no hope in their human frame of reference, while Nithard could at least explain things by putting them in cosmic terms. From there, the Franks' history. Everyone may gather how mad it is to neglect the common good and to follow only private and selfish desires, since both sins result the creator so much, in fact, insults him so fact that he turns even the elements against the madness of the sinner. About this time, on the 20th of March, there occurred an ellipse of the moon. Besides, a great deal of snow fell in the same night, and the just judgment of God, as I said before, filled every heart with sorrow. I mention this because rapine and wrongs of every sort were rampant on all sides, and now the unseasonable weather killed the last hope of any good to come. The Carolingian Era and the Universal Chronicle In essence, the Christian chronicle was universal history. The term chronicle stems from the Greek word chronikos, meaning belonging to time or concerning time, and chronicles aimed at describing how God worked his will in time. They became the, by far the most popular medieval historical genre. The chronicles, encompassing the wide spectrum of historical works from Asubius' pioneering codification of dates and facts to the comprehensive and narrative portraits of the past, and finally to histories limited to regions or states during the centuries in which the universal scope of life was merely referred to or hinted at. Not only the content, content varied. No clear definition delimited the chronicle from other historiographical forms, particularly the extensive annals of the latter period. Medieval historians were not as genre-conscious as modern scholars are. Actually, the chronicle's history constitutes its best definition. The Carolingian Empire, particularly in its declining phase, produced its own incentives for the writing of world histories. With the role of the Carolingian Empire in God's plan at stake, some Carolingian historians were fascinated by the concept of the sequence of empires, the Translatio and Peri, which they could easily learn about from Orosius and Justin's 2nd century epitome of Pompey Trogus. 
In his digest of universal history, Justin explained how the imperial power had been carried forward, translatum est, from the Assyrians to the Medes and so on. Later, Jordan's universal history drew a line from the Assyrians to the Medes, to the Persians, to the Macedonians, to the Romans, and even to the Goths and Roman soil. Other Christian historians had agreed with Augustine, who had objected to the close ties between mundane power and divine plan implied in the translatio concept, or found the universal church a sufficient universal tie. The specific question discussed by chroniclers of the 9th and early 10th centuries was whether the Carolingian Empire constituted a continuation of the Roman Empire, translatio, or was a novel state entirely different. With the post-Charlemagne Carolingian Empire beset by troubles, contemporaries hoped that the proper answer would not only yield a better understanding of their past and present, but also give an indication of as to their fate in the future times. <coughs> Notker of St. Gaul, reached back to the Daniel vision of the biblical text and spoke convincingly of Charlemagne's empire as the direct successor to the Roman Empire. In his universal chronicle, Addo of Vienne also referred, reaffirmed a continuous line of emperors from Augustus to Byzantium to Charlemagne, who was the emperor of Frankish origin. On the basis of remarks in devotional and literary works, we may assume that Addo's simple trust in continuity was shared by many of those who thought about such matters. Continuity was a reassuring concept to people who saw the key institution of their political order steadily disintegrating. Others flatly denied any link between Rome and Charlemagne at all. Paulus Diaconus, that supporter of the Carolingians who did not live long enough to know about Charlemagne's coronation, saw no connection of the Carolingian state with Rome. In his Roman history, a continuation of Eutropius's brief history to 553, he concluded that the Roman Empire had ended in 476, and therefore he ended the numbering according to Ap Urbe Condita, since the founding of Rome, at that date. Afterwards, he used incarnation years. Ever since 476, a new ingathering of nations had been going on, until under Charlemagne the West experienced a new integration. The 9th century bishop, Le Soux Frecouf, wrote his histories a decade or so after Charlemagne's death, but his narrative ended two centuries short of his own lifetime. Critical of traditions in general, he rejected any interpretation of the Carolingian Empire in terms of the translatio in Perry. In the late 500s, with Pope Gregory the Great, a new age had begun, and he had ended his chronicle at that point. For those who found both a sharp break in the past and an imperial continuity unsatisfactory, there remained in Isidorian fashion, the unity and continuity of past, present, and future through Christ's empire. Equally hostile to the translatio and peri concept was Abbot Regino of Prun, who experienced some of the tribulations that the West underwent between 850 and 950 through the Viking, Saracen, and Magyar invasions. His own monastery of Prun was devastated by the Vikings. He rejected the idea of a historical continuity through a sequence of empires. The collapse of the once great Carolingian state rather testified to divine providence and the transi uh, transitoriness of all worldly power. Every empire so far had exhausted itself by the efforts it put into its own expansion. That pattern of self-destruction alone linked empires to each other. As for the Roman Empire, it had ended when the Lombards had occupied much of Italy, and despite dire prophecies, its fall had not led to the end of the world. The only true and everlasting empire was Christ Church, whose fate was not dependent on the fortunes of any specific empire. At one point, God had selected the Franks to carry out his plan. Now that the Frankish Empire had ended, nobody knew who would be chosen next. Augustine, no favorite of medieval chroniclers, would have found comfort in the works of Paulus Diaconus and Regino. In a sense, these three historians paralleled in their rejection of the nexus between empire and Christian history the steps taken by the 6th and 7th century historians to disassociate Christian history from Rome. Alfred the Great in Anglo-Saxon history writing. England continued on its separate historiographical path, uninfluenced by new Rome theories. Actually, the Carolingian Empire was already disintegrating when Alfred the Great, King of Wessex, 871 to 899, built a stable and powerful political entity. In its context, Anglo-Saxon historiography brought forth a remarkable work, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. It was written in the vernacular, an unusual practice in the time when Latin was the proper language of learned discourse. The choice of language can be explained by Alfred's deliberate Anglo-Saxonism. 
that outstanding king himself translated Orosius's work into the vernacular and sponsored the translations of other late ancient works. Such feats made him worthy of the first biography of an Anglo-Saxon king, The Life of Alfred, by the Welsh Bishop Asser. Again, that's the late 8th century. The sacred history segment of the Chronicle that preceded the Anglo-Saxon history proper began with the incarnation of Christ, and in its brevity did little more than remind the reader that England was only one part of God's world. The Chronicle's major topic was the Anglo-Saxon past, with a distinctly positive accent on the Wessex royal dynasty, whose founders were identified as Cerdic and his son Seinric. Was the Chronicle then an official creation? A royal commission has never been proven, but the original version was sent out with official support to that, so that it would be copied in other monasteries, as if the creation of an official past had indeed been desired. While its Alfredian segment ended in 891, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle went on in many versions and respectable continuations. Two of the long versions reached up to and slightly beyond the Anglo-Saxon catastrophe of 1066 at the Battle of Hastings in the 11th century. That momentous event received understandably a reluctant recognition, exactly five sentences in the D version of the Chronicle. Anglo-Saxons found a better explanation for the catastrophe in a biography titled The Life of King Edward. It told that in late, in late 1065, the king neglected to quell the feud between Harold and Tostig, uh, Tostig, the son of the Earl of Wessex, and that when Edward died in January of 1066, the feud went on to ruin England. As for the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, it fared better than the Anglo-Saxons. In an ultimate compliment, the Chronicle was translated into Latin, and in that version survived the Anglo-Saxon debacle, although with steadily lessening vigor, and not for long. Two Histories as Monuments In his old age and in the seclusion of a monastery, Paulus Juanfridus, better known as Paulus Diaconus, the author of Augusta of the Bishops of Metz and of a Roman history, wrote the history of the Lombards as a monument to his people. In earlier years, he had served as a Lombard king, traveled widely, and spent as an, act an active period at the court of Charlemagne. Paulus drew from his sympathetic account on the Lombard epic tales and early Lombard history, the origin of the Lombard people, around 670. He spoke of the old Lombard home of the island of Scandia and gave a genealogy of Lombard kings as well as a brief account of the Lombard invasion of Italy in 568. He praised the Lombard invaders, contrasting them with the unworthy Byzantines who tried to hold on to their Italian possessions. In a, in a surprisingly naturalistic fashion, Paulus credited climate for the Lombard superiority and vigor. The further removed the northern region is from the heat of the sun and the more it is cooled by ice and snow, the healthier it is for the human body and the more it favors the increase in population. Just as in reverse, all the land to the south, the closer it is to the heat of the sun, is always full of diseases and less suited to human propagation. Climate and its changes, Paulus indicated, did not only explain Germanic superiority, but also gave the waves of Germanic migrations an explanation. Paulus's account reached only to 744, sparing him much embarrassment. After all, he himself had for years the, had the Carolingians as patrons, the very dynasty which finally vanquished the Lombard kingdom in the year 774. Sometime around AD 900, the Celtic view of the past, the very antithesis of the Anglo-Saxon view, was revived in the so-called History of the Britons, authored by a group of compilers, among them whom the Celtic monk Ninius was most important. The work offered an encyclopedic collection of Britannica, a description of the island, the history of Britons until 687, seven genealogies of people and kings, the story of a hero called Arthur, an account of St. Patrick's life, and memorable things about the land of the Britons. All of that was wrapped up into a sketchy universal framework with no less than 28 chronological systems. The history of the Britons really wished to stimulate British pride and even the hopes of a British recovery. Hence the stories of origins or collective genealogies, of which no less than four dealt with the Britons, giving them a combined Roman, Greek, and Trojan origin. According to one account, the Latin Lavinia married the Trojan Aeneas. Among their grandsons was Brutus, who, after having killed his father accidentally, became a wandering exile and eventually founded Britannia. In another, in another version, Brutus, as a Roman consul, conquered Britain and his descendants populated the isle. For centuries thereafter, the Brutus story, as a guarantor of the highly regarded Trojan ancestry, would form a part of early British history. As further assurance that the Britons could still have hope, there were the memories of great deeds by British heroes, 
especially the story of Arthur. In his 12th victory, there fell together in one day 960 men and one onset of Arthur, and no one laid them low save his self alone. And in all the battles he remained victor. Arthur, too, would not be forgotten in English, his geography.